Hey Google. That's right, Jay. Alright, here's Fifth Avenue Troll by Movie Song Music on YouTube. That should have been on camera. Mm. Welcome to Not Half on the Bag, because that's not my show. <clears throat> but I'm gonna copy him. Ready Player One. Let me make sure I'm in focus. Okay. Um. I haven't done one of these in a while. Fucking unstructured as shit, and I wish that I had bothered to set that up on a normal tripod rather than my Gorillapod for um, being able to do whip pans for little scene transitions, but whatever, it's fine. Isn't that right, big band? That's, it. it's fine. Just leave him in the background and you won't notice him that much. But it'll be a fun Easter egg. He's not even in frame. But there's a Sonic thing, there's a box and gloves, and there's another Sonic. I'm doing a bit. Just if you look for stuff in Ready Player One, it's entertaining. It's certainly more entertaining playing Where's Waldo with random bullshit that's in the fucking frame than it is actually watching Ready Player One. Are you getting my point here? So, let's see, general plot, um, fucking Halliday made an easter egg, and if you find the three keys and you get the easter egg, then you win, and you get to be Thanos of the Oasis, and then you, um, you get a trillion dollars, or a hundred trillion dollars, some fucking world economy destroying amount of money that doesn't matter at all because being in charge of the oasis is actually much much better that would be like if you took over facebook twitter google and basically every stream of public conscious that exists all at once because everybody in the world of ready player one plays the Oasis, they're all in VR chat doing Uganda Knuckles memes all the time. So, getting into the Oasis itself. Um, the Oasis, the, one of the very first things we're shown about the Oasis is the there's challenges for these keys. Um, you have to get all three keys, which is established, and I'll get back to that later, because it doesn't make any fucking sense for the finale. Um, they, they seem to forget that you need all three keys. Um, the first challenge to get a key is to figure out a way to win this impossible race that ends with everybody always getting crushed by King Kong and nobody can ever reach the finish line if they made it as far as King Kong. Um, the solution is apparently just go backwards. Um, and apparently, as we're told, before they show the race, people have been trying to find keys for five years, and nobody's gotten one yet. So you're telling me, let's say even, fuck it, let's say, like, the clue to get to the first challenge, which is the race, let's say that was found four years into the Oasis' Oasis's existence. Say that that's the matter. You're telling me that for an entire year, not one person has reversed in this race. Are you fucking joking? That's one of the very first things anybody who plays a racing game does. Is like, oh, I wonder, I wonder what happens if I go backwards. I wonder if I can crash into people coming the opposite way. It's not a lap race, but it's like a point A to point B race. But I refuse to believe that nobody in this world doesn't give a shit about points and they just want to fuck shit up and, like, try to clip out of world and stuff. Like, this this world doesn't have speedrunners. They don't exist. 
And then it turns out, um, they're, like, somehow, once the clues come out, people aren't just immediately, like, it doesn't just become part of the public conscious that, like, like, say a new trick is discovered in a speedrun, everybody will suddenly incorporate that trick into their any percent runs because it makes the whole run faster. It becomes part of the route. In this world, that information doesn't get shared, which is fair enough because there's a big prize behind it and you wouldn't want people catching up. But, it doesn't make any sense. Only the main five, or the high five, as they wind up calling themselves, uh, they're the only ones who wind up getting the first key. IOI, the bad guy organization, they don't, they don't get the keys. Um, they don't get any of the keys, actually. I don't think. Um, anytime something is referenced, it feels a lot like they're just reading their lines off of a cue card that's just out of frame, and it is a printout of a Wikipedia article. Um, towards the climax, when they're playing uh, Adventure, this becomes extremely noticeable because they keep fucking saying the same exact thing. It has multiple characters that say the exact same thing. And I'm just like, fucking stop it. It's horrible. Cut. Stop this. Cease. Um... I'm just going down my notes. They're not necessarily in order. Uh, TJ Miller is playing TJ Miller, so he's about... The only comic relief thing in this movie that actually sort of works. Because um, TJ Miller is just effortlessly funny. And he can just say whatever and it, it kind of works. He can just improv lines and you'll laugh. Um, <clears throat> going back to the race. The... First of all, the method of going backwards leads you to this spare track that has zero obstacles whatsoever. All you have to do is just navigate backwards and um, you can get the key for free without even really playing the game, which I feel is a waste, but whatever. Um, but Parzival, the main character, is using a skin of a DeLorean. And I say skin like that because in the race, he actually has a functional, like, hover mode where the wheels turn like that and then, like, slides and stuff. Um, so I'm going to just extrapolate that to, um, he has a fully functioning, at least, f like, physically, obviously you can't time travel in real life. Real life. Um a fully functional DeLorean. So... You're telling me he can't fly? Even though in order to have that... that slide function, the wheels have to do the thing that they did in the movie to make the DeLorean fly? He couldn't just fly over King Kong? Are you fucking joking? Like, this is what I'm talking about with people... It doesn't have speedrunners, because... Obviously, you would get that skin, and then you'd just be like, oh, well, I can just fly now. I'm just gonna go over... I'm just gonna skip the race and go that way and just fucking jump over the entire thing and not even bother being in danger or anything. Uh, um, during the race, also, there was no score at all, and it almost felt unfinished. It was weird. Like... Just no music whatsoever. Just a lot of not actually very loud sound effects. And a bunch of rumbling from the fucking D-Box seats that were in my theater. And I was like, God damn it. Who buys D-Box? Who fucking cares? Um, I am solving this for a reason. It's not just to... It's not just to distract myself. Um, there's a fucking... The longer it takes me to do this, the better my point becomes when I get to it. Um, so, after... After this race thing, the high five share it with each other, like, the method of getting to the key. 
And one of the, like, throwaway gags is uh, one of the High Five, con con uh, conveniently, the Asian one, or one of the two Asian ones, um, that finishes the race and gets the key of his own. He totaled his car on the way to getting it, which is like, how the fuck did you total your car on a course that had zero obstacles? Are you fucking joking? That's absurd. Anyways, on to IOI, the bad guy organization. <laughs> Um, so, IOI's whole shtick is like, they're, they're just throwing bodies at the issue of finding the egg. I could be in focus better. Uh, do, do, do. There we go. Um, so IOI is just throwing a ton of people at getting the egg, to the point where in the race they probably could have just been like, everybody... Just Zerg rush King Kong, and one of you will eventually fly over the pit, and the rest of you are dead, but we'll, we'll compensate you for your lost fun money. Um, so... <coughs> there's, um... IOI in general just has really, really fucking terrible security. Uh, it's established really early that Nolan keeps his password, just a post-it note on his rig. It's right there, visible to everybody that could just walk in and see it. Which becomes a thing, it's a plot point later on. Um, they also just don't seem to have a way to know what accounts are logged in to which terminals in the place, which seems like it would be really, really easy. Like, really easy. You can't even just get an IP address or something for your own local network or anything. You don't have any network traffic thing, whatever. Um, and people are somehow just able to like waltz in and out, it seems, of IOI. Um, they have security drones flying all over the place, and they can't just, like, they can ID people, but there's so many drones, you would think they have all, all points just covered, completely visible, except for, like, inside buildings where they probably only wouldn't do it because invasion of privacy or whatever the hell justification you want to give it. Um... To do. Uh, there's fairly early on um, when you get the first key, and I'm going to assume because they didn't confirm it the opposite way. When Parzival gets the first key, he mentions, "Oh, a hundred thousand coins just came into my account out of nowhere," which to me states that the key has a cash reward for anyone who gets one, which makes zeroing out. Not an issue at all. Uh, zeroing out, I think, is what happens when you die in the game. Like, you just lose all the coins in your inventory and whatever. Like, oh, it's a lot of work to get these items back. Um, except who cares? Because I can just die trying a bunch of different solutions go win the race again, get a hundred thousand coins, and I'm fine. Like, the the challenges would break the economy of this game. But, whatever, it's a movie. We shouldn't think about game-breaking techniques that the author obviously didn't think about, or the filmmakers didn't think about, or the creators of the game didn't think about at all. Um, still not done with this, by the way. It, it'll make sense when I get to it, don't worry. 
someone... Someone who can solve a cube, you know that I'm almost done. Fucking goddammit. Matt is probably watching this like, fucking finish the thing. I did it. I finally... That's the first time I've solved a Rubik's Cube in a long time. Anyways, now that I'm done solving this fucking thing and it took me... I don't have a timer there. Um, it took me that long to solve it. I will put a thing up on the video stream of how long it took me. But the point is... Um, unless you're a speed cuber, if you're trying to do something else, and you don't know how to solve a fucking Rubik's Cube by muscle memory, um, like, I'm just talking. I'm not being shot at right now. There's a bit where they're trying to figure out what the clue is for the second key, um, <laughs> And they have the Zemeckis cube, which it it's not even stated what it would do. Although, if you're familiar with Robert Zemeckis, the uh, maker of Back to the Future, you would think it would have something to do with time travel, and it does, which is retarded for multiple reasons. Number one, what I just demonstrated by trying to solve the Rubik's cube under a painfully minor amount of pressure. Uh, those are not easy to just solve for no reason, let alone for desperate, I'm being shot at, please save me, value. Number two, time travel in a multiplayer game is some bullshit. How, how the fuck are you doing time travel where... If someone falls down in the video game, they probably actually fell down in real life. So if someone's like, head over heels falling, and then you throw the Zemeckis cube, and it reverses time 60 seconds, I think it was. Uh... Like, do they fall... Do they flip around backwards? In, in the real life? Is that what happens? Like, mechanically, it doesn't make any sense. I don't get it. Or do they just have, like, a, a prompt on their Vive headsets that's like, you're being rewound, someone used the Zemeckis cube, we'll, we'll write you some place, like, we'll put you back in your correct orientation after the Zemeckis cube is done. Or something. I, it fucking doesn't make any sense. Gameplay. The Oasis would be a shit game, is what I'm getting at with all of this. Um, so, we have other game mechanic slash reference bullshit things, such as um, once Parzival gets his $100,000 coin thing, reward, 100,000 credits, it is. Um, he goes on a shopping spree, and one of the things he buys is the Holy Hand Grenade of Antioch, which you will no doubt recognize from Monty Python and the Holy Grail. Isn't that right, Princess Derplestia? Yeah. Still doing a bit. Um, he, he throws the Holy Hand Grenade eventually, like during the climax, but he doesn't count. What the fuck is the point of doing the holy hand grenade thing if you're not going to count one, two, five? Why do it at all? Just have a normal grenade that he throws in there. Like, yeah, I get it. You ha you have to have the references. You got to do the thing. But they did the thing without doing the other thing that the thing is known for. Yeah. That's the rules. You have to do it. He didn't count to one, two, or three. It just threw it, uh, and then it made the it, it did a Star Wars explosion, and then who cares? So the the worst line in the movie, at least that I remember, and am desperately trying to forget, was when uh, 
Parzival and the High Five had hacked. They took his password because they saw it. That's not hacking, that's social engineering. Um, they, uh, they took control, is a better phrasing for it than they used, of Nolan's rig. And he's like, they're like interrogating him and, or no, 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 this is a different scene. Oh my God, I'm mixing together two scenes because this movie just, oh, it's a mess. Um, there's a scene where Nolan sends a message to Wade Watts because he found out who Parzival was in real life. Um, and he gets him as a hologram, and it's like a, it, it's basically like a VR Skype call. And he gets him as a hologram in his own office with his fucking password just hanging out. So his account could be stolen by any random asshole that he does this with, because I can't imagine Parzival's the first person he's ever done this with. Just fucking idiot. Um, uh, so he does this, and then he has his board of directors in an earpiece in his ear, and they're listing off all of these references that he should be making, references that Halliday would know, um, and Parzival calls him on it. Probably mostly because it was like hell. Uh, how do you do, fellow kids? The scene, as if this movie isn't. How do you do, fellow kids? The movie. Um, but the line is, a fanboy knows a poser, and I'm just like, ah! Stop! Stop it! Stop doing that! You fucking faggot! Ugh! That's the lamest shit I've ever heard. You're not cool for being a fanboy. People make fun of fanboys. I say as I wear a full Blade Runner outfit and have my lights set to Blade Runner settings and I'm drinking bourbon like in Blade Runner. I went to the movie dressed like this, by the way. Just just to make me look like a big hypocrite. Um, so, getting more towards the climax, um, which just had a bunch of do you recognize that thing in the crowds? Like, you can play a bunch of Where's Waldo? Like, find Tracer. Oh, Tracer just was dead center. Okay, find the battle. T nope, they were pretty. Battle Toads were right there. Um, Tassadar, Battle Toads, the Iron Giant, probably like a demon from Doom. Um, at one point, Artemis pulls out the. Um, the gun from Gears of War that I don't know the name of. I think Parzival also fires the Law anti-tank rocket launcher from Halo. There's a bunch of Halo Spartans. It's just... Do you know this reference? The movie. Which everybody knew this, this was going to be a movie for that, but it's like, fuck. I don't have... I, I ran myself out of props in the first minute of this, so now I regret just doing the thing. Um, so I already touched on IOI not looking up people attached to where, but I didn't actually mention why. Um, Artemis gets kidnapped, or whatever, coerced by IOI to come work for them, and just be part of them. Um, like, it, she has some pressure put on her via bills or some stupid bullshit. Um, but part of the climax is all of IOI is being wiped out because Artemis is still in the building and they don't know where, even though she's on their network, they should be able to pull where she's at. There's, there's a handful of things in this movie that move at the speed of plot. And one of them is the IOI guys trying to find Artemis in their building, on their hardware, on their network. Bullshit. Um, another thing that moves at the speed of plot is when they're out of IOI, or not dealing with IOI directly anymore, and they're in a mail truck. Um... 
like the VR, if you physically move in a certain way, that's how you move in the game. And one of the things that has to happen once all of the keys are collected is all the keys need to be put into the keyholes and they need to be turned. And like as this is happening, Parzival's getting bounced around in the moving truck, which by the way, why the fuck is the truck moving? Why is it not just parked in an alley like it definitely was shown to be? And just put a tarp over it so IOI's drones can't ID your truck? Like, why... Why this movie? Uh, but during the climax, there's Gundam, there's the Iron Giant, there's Mecha Godzilla, there's random video game weapons, there's who fucking cares? Ugh. It's boring. Um, there's also this orb that makes an impenetrable force field. And I'm pretty sure that the, the on-off switch... It's a magic, magical spell, but I'm pretty sure it was just in Klingon, or it was in Dothraki. It was in some made-up language, but definitely one that nerds would know, and I'm sure that that's another Easter egg for people to be able to translate the stupid fucking on-off switch. Um, but then after all the climax, oh, my whole... I think I'm that drunk, but whatever. I'm rambling, just like this movie does. Um, the um, turning the keys and stuff. Parzival's being bounced around, so it's like sliding the key around and shit. And he's like really trying to get it in the whole phrasing. Um, but then after he turns the keys and gets into the room with Halliday, for the most part, he stops getting bounced around, even though I know for goddamn sure they were still driving around and being hit constantly with IOI cars on either side of them. They weren't stopping, but just to let the scene play out cleanly, Parzival wasn't being thrown around like, oh, fuck, oh, shit, Halliday, help, fuck, I'm fucked up. Um, so, like, that didn't make any sense. That's another moving at the speed of plot thing, where, like, oh, we gotta have the tension while he's turning the keys, right? But then, once the keys turned, the speed of plot slows down, and everything just gets calm for a bit. And then it sort of pulls you back to reality when they knock him almost... It oh, there's the button that... If you push the button, it deletes the oasis completely. Oh, you, oh, they they almost made him touch it on accident. Oh my god! But he doesn't, and they don't. They don't push the button. I wish they did. That would have been a better ending. But the ending is uh, they get control of the oasis after passing a stupid test. Um, that was a lot like the test at the end of Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory. Um, they get control of the Oasis, and then they ban loyalty centers. They don't outright ban IOI, they just ban anyone that is like IOI, which means IOI has to shut down. By the way, IOI's building looks like it just says LOL, which is probably the joke or a joke I hope it was because it looked dumb it literally looks like this this the the drowning guy that you can see lol as um, like it's capital I their building is shaped capital I lowercase o wait it, it's shaped LOL. It's like that. Kind of. Um, they ban anyone that's like IOI, and they shut down the Oasis on Tuesdays and Thursdays as a sort of, people should get out of the house more. But that's stupid. Like, I understand. 
that you would want to, like, maybe send a message of people getting out of their house more, getting off, like, just get off your phones a little more. But, no. <laughs> like, I feel like if anybody wants to sit in their give up machine all day of every day until they die, they should be free to do that. They're not harming anyone by doing that other than themselves, and I don't really care if someone manages to kill themselves playing a video game. And it's extra hypocritical because Parzival and Artemis, like, they get together and they're co-in-charge of the Oasis, who gives a shit about the other three of the main five, they don't matter. Um, they make this decision together to make it so people have to get out two days a week. Um, except they were constantly in the Oasis, and that's how they found each other, and that's how they basically rule the world now. Um, and I don't have a second point because I covered what was going to be my second point in the first point. But, like, they're just preventing anyone from doing the same thing that they're, that they did to get where they are two days a week. Which I feel like would just have people like, well, what the fuck do I do now on those two days a week? I know that if I have two days off from work, the first day is like, okay, I get to chill and rest and take care of some things. And the second day is like, what the fuck do I do with myself? I guess I'll go see a movie. Like, I go see movies most nights. But, point still stands. Two days away from the thing that I'm always doing, and I'm just like, what is life? And I don't... I genuinely don't think that people in um, Ready Player One's universe have enough outside lives for that to be a worthwhile thing to visit, to be forced to visit two days a week. If they do, more power to them, but those people probably would have left the Oasis for two, three, five, seven days a week if their lives were worth it. But their lives might not be worth it, and the Oasis is a nice escape from that. So, whatever. Man, Ready Player One was bad. It was boring. Shit. Anyways, I think I've been to the movies like 15, if not 20 times since the last time I did one of these. I'm not going to do these for nearly every movie I see anymore. I'm going to do them when I feel motivated. Ready Player One was bad enough that I was like, oh my god. Like, I, I didn't mention any cinematography stuff, really, because Steven Spielberg knows how to move a camera. Like, he's good at movies. He has a doctorate in movies, I think. <laughs> um, that's what my friend told me. The, the friend that I know was cringing at me failing miserably at this. But, um, there, there was one cinematographical, cinematographical, I don't know, if, is that a word? Is that how, if, if that's a word, is that how you would pronounce it? Um, there's one thing with the cinematography that bothered me, and that is, um, thank God this is in arm's reach, um, the, the drones that IOI use, they apparently have handheld, they have handheld cameras mounted to them, because, uh, one of the drones, it does, it does an optical zoom, which this doesn't have, and I don't believe any current day drone has optical zoom, unless you, like, mount... I was about to grab... Oh, actually, this will work. This will work as an example. Um, unless you were to mount a camera like this, where you can actually, 
you know, optically zoom the lens to, say, a DJI Inspire, like, have it carry the camera, and then if it has a power zoom, you could do an optical zoom remotely, right? That's the extent of the technology today. Um, but their drones have a thing where they can do optical zoom via the camera that exists in them, which is fine if the technology advances to the point where we put um, servo zooms in drones, fine, whatever. My problem is when the drone zooms in on this guy that's standing around in the street, the camera shakes as if the drone was like trying to steady its own thing. Most, if not all drones that have cameras built into them, at least above a certain price point or made by certain people, um, most drones have gimbals. And if you don't know what a gimbal is, it just takes, it takes Parkinson's and turns it into rock steady, right? So all of this fucking bullshit camera shake f for the drone apparently trying to right itself with its camera, that doesn't exist already. That's not a thing that we have to deal with, period. Now. This movie is set... I'm trying to crack my jaw. Um, this movie is set in, like, 2045 or whatever. Why couldn't it be 2049, goddammit? 2049 is a better year. Um, this movie's set so far in the future that, like, we're having power zooms in drones, but they never invented the gimbal. Like, what are you doing, Steven? Steven Spielberg, you know what cameras are. You know how they work. Why did you use a handheld camera for your drone shots? This is bullshit. Took me out of the movie. Fuck you. It's not that big a deal. I, I only noticed that because I know cameras. And I've spent too much on cameras to not know cameras. So... I think that's all I have to say about Ready Player One. That's probably more than anyone needs to say about Ready Player One. It, nobody expected it to be any fucking good. Oh! There's the last thing! And I'm so glad I didn't think of it until right now. Because it really was, it truly was the last thing about the movie. Um, and it's just a personal thing that happened at the end of the movie. Um, as the credits started rolling, like, I... I'm slowly kind of becoming a bad moviegoer, kind of, even though I mostly go by myself. Like, I will occasionally not internalize thoughts like, why? Or, don't they have guns? Like, okay, stepping back from what I was going to say, there's a bit where Nolan, in real life, goes with a gun to kill Parzival in real life while before he gets the Easter egg, but then he gets it. Um, he has a gun, and he threatens an entire crowd of people living in what they have established in words as a ghetto. He threatens an entire an, an entire crowd of people with a gun. It's just a pistol. It's a semi-automatic pistol at best, right? He threatens a whole crowd of lower class people with a gun. He's by himself. And I just let out, not, not one of them has a gun. Nobody, nobody has a gun. It wasn't that loud. I was just like, nobody has a gun. Um, but I'm, I'm getting to the point where I'm that guy, kind of in theaters, and I'm, I try not to, but when the movie is so shit that I just can't control myself. Anyways, <laughs> once the credits started rolling, the, uh, like, I just let out a, a defeated, boo, like, as, just only that loud, 
you know, and the credits were already rolling, who fucking cares? But the guy sitting right next to me is, he just, like, tries to join in with me. He's like, ugh, disgrace to the book. And then I'm like, the book is a disgrace! Fuck you! I didn't say fuck you. I did say the book is a disgrace, but I didn't say it that loud. I was like, the book is a disgrace. And then I got up and left. But then I realized I forgot my hip flask in my armrest. And then I was like, shit, I gotta go back. I look stupid. Fuck. Grabbed my flask and I walked out of the theater. <sighs> Nobody noticed I was dressed as fucking Ryan Gosling from Blade Runner. Nobody ever notices. Maybe one peep one couple noticed one time that I've been to the movies lately. Eventually, someone will notice, and I'll be like, yeah, we're best friends now. Anyways, that's enough talking about Ready Player One, and I don't have to... I don't have the fortitude for more shots, so... <laughs> I gotta end this shit. Um... Yeah, whatever. Subscribe, whatever. Who fucking cares? Ready Player One sucks! Go see other- th go see Thoroughbreds if it's still available where you're at. Nobody watched this all the way through. Who the fuck am I kidding? See you in the next one.